Welcome back, mitochondriacs. It's Dr. Peebler for another episode of Cancer is a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. I felt it was fairly fitting to do the next several lectures, in particular talking about vitamin D and melatonin, which are some of our most powerful allies against cancer and disease prevention as well, outside, because essentially, cutting to the chase, that's how you get it, by being outside. And it felt a little bit wrong and hypocritical to be sitting inside under artificial light for these talks in particular. One of my favorite favorite sayings of Dr. Jack Cruz is you, you can't get well in the environment in which you got sick. And I don't have the exact statistics, but I think most of us spend the majority of our time inside. And when you're inside, you are blocked from the most critical and helpful parts of nature. One of those critical aspects is light. Even when you have windows that are bringing in lots of natural light, you're blocking a lot of the most beneficial spectrums of light, UV, ultraviolet, and infrared. And in order to talk about vitamin D and subsequently melatonin, we're going to have to know a little bit about ultraviolet and infrared. So let's dive into it. I'll bet you didn't know that when you tuned in today to talk about vitamin D, we were going to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. But we are because you have to understand if you don't already that light is not homogenous and light that we experience out here in nature is different than it is in there. And in fact, it's vastly different. And we're going to talk about that in great detail in the future, especially when we talk about circadian rhythms and circadian biology. But getting back on topic, what we're interested in, in particular for vitamin D production, is the ultraviolet B from 270 to about 320 nanometers. And that corresponds with the wavelength of light. So it's going to be right in this area right here. On the other hand, when we get into our talk about melatonin, a little bit down the line, we're going to be talking about infrared light. And that's a very long wavelength. And interestingly enough, both ultraviolet and infrared are invisible to our eyes. The solar spectrum that I'm being exposed to right now looks something like this. We have some amount of UV at this time, quite a bit less. It's about 4.30 in the afternoon. But the UVA and UVB are tapering off and almost gone in South Florida right now. But the visible, as you can see me on camera, is still there. And the invisible, near infrared, is also still there. As a matter of fact, 52% of the solar spectrum, no matter what time of year, no matter how cloudy, no matter what latitude, is going to be near infrared. And the reason I hammer this point home is because maybe you live at a high latitude. Maybe you're in vitamin D winter where at your particular location, geographic location, you're not making any UV or a significant amount of ultraviolet light that part of the year. You will not be able to create vitamin D in your skin at that point in the year. That's why they call it vitamin D winter. However, you will be able to get the benefits of the infrared light, which is abundant no matter where you're at, no matter what time of year, et cetera. And that's going to be important for several things. But one of the most important things that we understand so far about infrared light is that it's a potent stimulator of melatonin. As I alluded to, sunlight at certain latitudes, certain parts of the day and certain parts of the year is going to produce shortwave UVB light. And that is going to be between 290 and 315. I think I said 270 and 320 earlier, but it's going to be the shorter wavelength of UVB is going to convert the chemical precursor of 7-dehydrocholesterol, a cholesterol derivative, a steroid pre-hormone. It's going to get converted without the need of an enzyme or protein to convert this. It's going to be all done by light, UV light, and you're going to make the vitamin D three chemical. And what's interesting is that it's going to go through a series of steps and little known fact, there are several vitamin D analogs that have powerful effects on the body. And we're going to talk about those in the near future, but essentially seven dehydrocholesterol gets converted to cocalciferol or vitamin D3. And then in the liver, it's going to get 25 hydroxylated to 25 OHD3. This is the test that we check for when we're checking vitamin D status in patients who do not have chronic kidney disease or in renal disease because normally as long as you don't have significant liver or kidney dysfunction you're going to convert that 25 hydroxy to 125 hydroxy at the kidney level when you have significant chronic kidney disease or god forbid in stage renal disease when you're on dialysis you lose this ability to one hydroxylate the vitamin d and it's not going to be converted to the active calcitriol molecule that is also known as 125 hydroxy vitamin d this is the metabolism that most of us when we go through medical 
medical school talk about, and we talk about it in the context of bone metabolism and calcium metabolism. That's why on the initial slide, I said more than just calcium metabolism, because up until not too long ago, vitamin D was thought to be only a hormone that dealt with calcium and bone metabolism. That has been debunked thoroughly over the last at least probably 20 years. Vitamin D, both the inactive, the active, and the precursors and metabolized derivatives that are not exactly 125 or 25 hydroxy vitamin D have a diverse amount of genes and biologic processes that it regulates. So just looking at the mitochondria, it's involved in reactive oxygen species scavenging, the reactive oxygen species response or the antioxidant response element, overall protection of the mitochondria. It's going to also deal with ion flux, oxidative phosphorylation, mitochondrial dynamics such as fission and fusion, and you'll see other mitochondrial dynamics as well, as well as apoptosis. Part of these hormones are going to act locally on the organelles, such as the mitochondria directly, and then some of the hormone will get used to signal within the nucleus as a true hormone. Some of the actions are receptor mediated on the cell membrane. Some of them go through membrane signaling cascades. Obviously, this is a cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease talk, and we're not going to be talking about in this particular video, all of the amazing things and all the amazing disease processes that vitamin D regulates and modifies. But we have type 2 diabetes mellitus, we have fibromyalgia and chronic pain, we have hypertension, heart failure, atherosclerosis, immune system and inflammatory disorders, thyroid diseases, inflammatory bowel diseases such as ulcerative colitis, as well as cancer. We're obviously going to dive in heavily into its role in cancer, but also in things like dementia and neurodegeneration. Vitamin D is probably one of your most powerful allies to maintain your health. Can you get it through a pill? Can you get vitamin D3 or vitamin D2 from a pill? Yes, you can. But will it have the same diverse mechanisms of action that it would be if you were sitting outside in direct sunlight? at the right time of the day. No, it will not. And I'm going to paint that picture very clearly, hopefully in the coming slides. So as we talked about, mitochondrial health is directly related to vitamin D status. And in particular, 125-hydroxy vitamin D is going to control mitochondrial volume and branching and expression of profusion proteins. Remember OPA1, optic atrophy 1, a very important protein that helps maintain the mitochondrial cristae, which is going to help maintain the mitochondrial super complex, which is going to help maximize energy production while minimizing excess oxidative stress. It's also going to have a direct relationship with the MECOS system. The MECOS system is the multiple protein mitochondrial cristae formation control mechanism that is so important to maintain morphology and crista shape so that the mitochondrial respiratory proteins are lining up correctly and forming the super complexes. In this paper, it's saying that vitamin D3 positively regulates mix 60 expression, which may be one of the important molecular mechanisms that vitamin D could ameliorate age-related, in this case, is talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or a cause of chronic liver disease. But it's exciting that a chemical such as vitamin D, which is absolutely free if you're able to get outside and get yourself exposed to the sunlight, can have all these amazing effects. Vitamin D supplementation rescues symvastatin-induced myopathy via improving mitochondrial crystal shape. We talked about OPA1. We we've talked about the mycos proteins that are important for the mitochondrial shape, but this is showing how it will reverse crystal damage that can improve a ATP production and oxidative stress. Remember how I talked about during the Krista and super complex videos that whenever you see improved Krista shape, that's going to be a code word for improving the mitochondrial super complex formation, which as it says here is going to increase ATP production and reduce oxidative stress, which is the same role of the mitochondrial super complex. I think that's where we're going to stop today because vitamin D has such a diverse amount of roles. I don't want to overwhelm you. This is going to be a multi-part micro series on vitamin D and its role in your health. But in particular, as you're going to see, it's going to have important and critical roles for cancer prevention and cancer treatment. So stay with us. If you like the video, please like it, subscribe, and stay with us on this journey. Until next time.